So the U.S. Uh, Latino population is the spiritual, um, you know, heirs of San Juan Diego, and that brings with it great opportunity, but also a big responsibility, right? So, and that's something that we should really, you know, uh, take advantage of and and own and and recognize that. And it's also, to me, part of the the beauty as Catholics of recognizing that all of these rich patrimonies and experiences are for all Catholics. <music> Welcome back. I'm Darnell Miller, producer here at Max Studios, and today I have the privilege of sitting down with Deacon Charlie Echeverry. Um, thanks for being here today. Great to be here, Darnell. Thank so, you for having me. Absolutely. So you're a husband, father, speaker, entrepreneur, podcaster. I'm sure I'm missing three or four other things. Then we're both missing them. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they are. That's that's good. Yeah. Yeah. But I know what the, the kind of the crux of your career has been helping people, helping businesses, helping organizations find emerging markets yeah. and kind of figuring out how to minister to them. And you're doing the same thing in the church. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is and what that looks like? Yeah, that's a crazy thing is that, you know, God has taken in large parts what I've recognized over the last few years is this idea of taking the secular tools that I had kind of built and understood but now increasingly applying them in the vineyard. So yes, my career really began in media and in mm -hmm. digital media. A lot of the stuff that we're doing here um, back in the early days and kind of followed all throughout all the different permutations and iterations of it, but mostly on the secular side or entirely really on the secular mm -hmm. side. But over the course, I would say since my ordination, um, there's been this kind of gravitational pull to bring some of that experience from the secular world into the religious space, into the vineyard, right? Mm -hmm. And so part of me has been kind of trying to bridge that gap and match those things. And yes, to your uh, other point, most of um, you know my area of expertise and experience is around two things, emerging platforms, digital ones mm -hmm. mainly, yeah. and emerging audiences. So the way that demographically the country and specifically for those interested the church have been evolving pretty dramatically over the last uh, couple of generations. Absolutely. So here in Houston, we house the Kinder Institute with, um, which is, um, oh, what's his name? Dr. Uh, Steven Kleinberg, who okay. does a lot of the demographic serving for, mm -hmm. um, for the United States. And this is something that we talk about a lot because we're in Houston, but Houston, the city of Houston demographically looks like what the United States is going to look like in like 40, 50 years. Yep. And so he always talks about our responsibility to navigate some of these challenges, to navigate these transitions, so that way we can help the rest of the US. It's the tip of the spear, right? In a way, it's interesting what you say, because like people should recognize what you just said and say, okay, well, let me look at what, what's going on in Houston mm -hmm. so that I can recognize, kind of see around the corner, what, what does the future look like? Yeah, absolutely. And get sort of prepared for that. Well, that's a lot of the work that I do that, you know, professionally, that's a lot of the work mm -hmm. that I do is help, you know, companies, brands, other folks like that look around the corner mm -hmm. and go, okay, well, here's what's coming. How do I best serve these constituencies? How do I get prepared for them? Mm -hmm. What changes do I need to do? Like that kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah. what does the future of the church look like in America? It's a great question because sadly the, the, the trend lines are not super encouraging right now, mm -hmm. but of course there's always, um, you know, the opportunity for intervention and us impacting those trend lines. But mm -hmm. right now in the United States, probably the biggest story is what's happening with the Latino population. Absolutely. Right. So, uh, statistics as of today, about 40% of the Catholic church four zero percent of the Catholic church, uh, is Hispanic, but and that's an impressive number, but that only tells part of the story mm -hmm. because if you slide down the scale and look at Catholics that are young, right? And specifically like under 18, yeah. what you find there is a statistic that's over 60%. Oh, so, wow. and yet at the same time, the, the church across the board, the Catholic church is contracting, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this crazy dynamic where we're shedding a lot of Catholics across the board, but the Latino Catholic population is sort of increasing and it's stabilizing that that decrease, yeah. but nevertheless it's shrinking. So you don't have to be this uh, you know, sort of economist or long range modeler to understand that where we go, if you fast forward, is a smaller, more Latino church. Mm -hmm. And I always talk about the fact that neither of those things 
even though I am Latino, but neither of those things are things we should want. Why not smaller? Because we'd like to get the gospel out to everybody. Yeah. And why not uh, monolithically Latino? Because part of the richness of our faith is its multicultural character. And so even though we want every Latino to be Catholic and enjoy the, the, the fullness of that reality, we don't want it to only be <laughs> yeah. Latino, right? And so, um, and, and so, anyway, that's those are what the trend lines kind of currently indicate. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a really good insight, and I do think I, I like that you acknowledge that there's, you know, it's going to be more Latino, but we should desire that other cultures share in this because um, growing up in Latino, growing up in, you know, going to Spanish mass, I really enjoy the richness of my, of my faith and the, the intricacies of my particular faith tradition within yeah, the Catholic faith. Of and I'm sure people who are Polish, people who are Vietnamese, people who are Korean have that same fondness for, for the way the faith is interpreted in, you know, in, in their backgrounds and they want to see that continue. Yeah. So um, for one to kind of overtake everything is yeah, denying a, the, the diversity that God's created. Amen. And I was going to go right to that, you know, in, in, in looking at the way the church views uh, the idea of diversity, and it is mentioned several times uh, in the catechism as an example, it views diversity in a couple of different contexts. One of them is in the diversity of gifts that people have to bring mm -hmm. to the table. And two is the diversity of cultural experiences and other experiences in which they experience and can share those gifts. And so do, the, the, the catechism Catechism very clearly points out that diversity is never opposed, that diversity, that understanding of diversity mm -hmm. is never opposed to the richness of unity that the church is. So we should desire that and we should mm -hmm. desire to, you know, benefit and grow from all of these different cultural experiences. There is one note though, Darnell, that I would say that's different about the Latino community in the U.S. that distinguishes it somewhat from Polish, Italian, and other waves mm -hmm. of previous immigration. And it's an important one to consider. Number one is the size that we're mm -hmm. talking about. Okay, we're talking about right now more than 60 million people in this country. If if the Latino population in the U.S. was its own country, it would be the second largest Spanish-speaking country in the world next wow. to Mexico. Okay. Okay. So number one is the size. Number two is the degree to which technology has impacted our ability to stay in touch with past culture, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's a phone call, you know, voice over IP on WhatsApp or listening to content from another culture, all that stuff is a lot easier to do. Mm -hmm. So I can retain cultural cues in a different way than previous waves could, right? If you Absolutely. were getting on a on a ship from Italy or something, you know, back a hundred and some odd years ago, like once you said goodbye, like you were gone. Yeah, and right? there's no way to experience the way the culture is shifting within your home country. That's right, the way you not as now. much, yeah. exactly. So what that, the, the net effect of all that is that you have this, what used to be this kind of assimilation thing, which is like, hey, I've come here and now I just, mm -hmm. I make the switch. Yeah, there's like little neighborhoods that are like Little Italy or Little China or yeah. whatever it is. But beyond that, you kind of make the switch and over time, like your kids are just gonna grow into this. Mm -hmm. It's a little different for the Latino population where that, uh, that um, assimilation isn't really as crisp and clear. And it's more of a longer range process mm -hmm. of acculturation that oftentimes happens over many generations, right? And so- that's an important point to consider because I hear that all the time. It's like, well, wait a minute, you know, my grandparents were from Slovakia and like, we're not speaking Slovakia. It's like, yeah, but it was a, a different time and place, mm -hmm. right? And so people can hold on to language, culture, music. Look what like Latino music yeah. is doing. Like who's the biggest Latino pop star in the world right now? You know, it's like all these folks, you know, you think about who, who they are, Bad Bunny and all these yeah. people, and I'm not endorsing their music. I'm just saying <laughs> they're who popular. they are. Yeah. They're huge, right? And it's like, would that have been the case 50 years ago? Probably mm -hmm. not. Well, I also think it's interesting what they're doing because they know they're hitting US markets. And I know Jay Baldwin's talked about it. He's For like, sure. I'm not going to speak English. Yeah, he has very publicly. Um, yeah. So it's like, you know, you want to kind of interview me and talk to me? It's like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I'm not necessarily advocating that either, but yeah. I'm just saying that there's, it's now not like there's crossover music folks because mm -hmm. we've always had that. Yeah. But it's that the kind of mainstream thing has changed changed a little bit, right? Has, and so yeah. all of that is driven in large part by this dynamic that I'm talking about. Absolutely. And so I think what's really interesting is that here at the University of St. Thomas, mm -hmm. we're a Hispanic serving institution. We have a, a, a large, you know, majority of our campus is uh, Hispanic, you know, Spanish speaking most of the time, mm -hmm. um, Hispanic backgrounds granted, whether that's Mexican, Salvadorian, wherever, Ch a Chilean, a yeah. Colombian. So it's a wide range within that. Within that. Um, but I do think that we have a really cool opportunity here, knowing that that's what the demographics of the church are going to look like and mm -hmm. um, that we need to minister to these uh, these students in particular ways. Yeah. 
Um, and, and I was very impressed when I heard the statistics on the campus and, and you know, how, uh, you know, diverse it is and how much it over indexes and also how just deeply, deeply uh, Catholic and Christian it is. And I think those are amazing, mm -hmm. you know, things when, when you consider them. But I think you hit on um, a really important concept, which is if we're going to reach and minister to and connect with people, like step one is to know who they are, learn about them, mm -hmm. try to understand their experience, right? Um, so people can see themselves, you know, in the thing that you're talking about Absolutely. in a different way, right? That's a very powerful motivation. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. In your uh, in your OSV talk, you say uh, inside like the outside. Mm -hmm. um, that idea that the people you're ministering to need to be reflected by the people ministering to them. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is a cool opportunity for our students. Um, I might take that responsibility personally. I, I feel like I have an opportunity to do this, so I need to. But this is something that I want to like, take to our students and mm -hmm. say, like, hey, like, you have an opportunity to step into leadership roles. Mm -hmm. Like, you're you're going to be called upon, and you need to answer that call. So that way, people coming up see you and feel seen. And that's a really important thing because by and large, if we're just isolating the Latino community, the Latino community has an over-index in interest in getting involved, mm -hmm. but an under-index in actual participation in things. And so if you think about this, well, wait a minute, how could it be that people say they want to do more, and yet when I look at what's actually happening, there's less of them involved in uh, ministries, uh, you know, institutions, mm -hmm. things like that. And part of the answer to that, to my mind, is an invitation issue, which mm -hmm. is if I've got a lot of interest, but I'm not showing up, well, yeah, that could be on me. Maybe I'm just faking it that I'm interested. Okay, but probably not. Could it be that the invitation isn't necessarily there? And, and this isn't just a one-way street. It's not Absolutely. like Latinos should sit back and wait to be invited. Like we should also take the leadership position that you're, that you're talking about. But my point is that we do have, as a people, a community, a desire to get more involved, mm -hmm. a desire to do more. And yet we're not showing up uh, in the church and in other places to the degree that either we should be or say that we want to. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's the, the solution to that is more invitation by people who might not be Latino and like, you know, pulling ourselves up and going like, hey, I want to do this and asking God how he can help us get to those outcomes. It's it's a two-way street, yeah, but it's absolutely. a really interesting dynamic that currently exists. Yeah, that's funny. So I, the other day we interviewed one of our students mm -hmm. who's going to medical school and he talked about, uh, he's actually a non-Catholic that came to the university and he talked about part of his fear was that he was going to be ostracized because um, he didn't follow our, tra our faith tradition. And he's oh, like, what I found was that when I showed up, people like accepted me. And yeah. he's like, he's like, there's, he's like, I believe that um, you can find your people and you can fit in in places and you do belong in places that you don't know you belong mm -hmm. in yet. And so I want to reiterate that message for, you know, all the Latinos out here, right? Yeah. That we do belong. Of course. Uh, you said something that was really beautiful in that OSV talk. Like we are the, uh, the legacy of, uh, San Juan Diego. Yeah. The spiritual heirs. Yeah. yeah. And so I just think of like, we're, we're in the Americas. Like what a responsibility. That, it's a huge like, one. That and, is. And, and, and what full, an opportunity. It's a huge opportunity. And full disclosure, those are the words of Archbishop Gomez. Gomez that I very cleverly lifted and inc incorporated that talk. <laughs> but Archbishop Gomez, um, who's my bishop in Los Angeles, um, you know, talks about that. It's like we have this amazing patrimony, but also a mantle of responsibility that if we think about, you know, Our Lady of Guadalupe through Juan Diego and all of the, you know, evangelization and, mm -hmm. and mission that he did transformed an entire continent. But that journey's not done. It's mm -hmm. not even close to done, right? Even if you think of the Americas, like, we, that includes the U.S. and Canada, yeah. right? So, so the U.S. Uh, Latino population is the spiritual, um, you know, heirs of Saint Juan Diego, and that brings with it great opportunity, but also a big responsibility, mm -hmm. right? So, and that's something that we should really, you know, uh, take advantage of and and own and, mm -hmm. and recognize that. And it's also, to me, part of the the beauty as Catholics of recognizing that all of these rich patrimonies and experiences are for all Catholics. Mm -hmm. They're for all Catholics, mm -hmm. right? It's like, if you have a devotion to Our Lady, but maybe you have a devotion to Our Lady, um, you know, as Our Lady of Lourdes or Our Lady of Fatima or whatever, Our Lady of Guadalupe is just as much Our Lady, right? And she's the patroness of the Americas. So it's recognizing that all of these things are part of your patrimony or part of the things that you can claim in a way. So even if you're not Latino, because I'm very sensitive 
of something, Darnell, that I've seen, I don't know if you have, but I've seen a lot where people sometimes don't feel permission mm -hmm. to weigh in or opine if they're not a member of that community. I understand that to a degree, mm -hmm. but I think that our popular culture um, can distort that into this sort of force field where, oh, well, you're not black or you're not Latino. So your opinion doesn't matter in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is decidedly anti-Catholic. I really mm -hmm. do. It's like, we're all brothers and sisters, part of a greater community. We're not called to be balkanized into like segments, right? Mm -hmm. We're called to look at the riches and the gifts of all these cultures, mm -hmm. but in a way fully recognizing them as part of our broader Catholic tradition and, and, and Catholic patrimony. So in a way they belong to all of us. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's an important point to make. Yeah, I think I, I agree with that. And I think one thing that we could probably do better to kind of bridge that divide is like, rather than like a culture of calling people out, it's a culture of calling people in. Amen, that's and awesome. And so I think- Stealing that too. Okay. <laughs> I, I, so I, I next forget, talk. I forget why I heard it from, so it's not mine. I oh, didn't okay. come up that's with it, but- right. it's, uh, a, it's a patchwork quilt, all yeah, of these talks are Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I, I think that's what we're called to do, right? Yeah. Like there's like there's there's value in all cultures and there's things that every culture needs to address and needs to work on. Yeah. And th the only way we're going to figure this out is if we help each other. I have I have heard this along the same lines, um, this idea of calling people in. It's part of a broader ministerial mindset mm -hmm. that kind of tries to flip the script a little bit about how things have been in the past. So in the past, and I don't even know what the past is, we, depending on how long we go, we can talk about that, but <laughs> there's a sense of, you know, believe and then behave and then belong. Mm -hmm. But um, actually it was, uh, we just mentioned him recently, Kyle from uh, Spoke Street, okay, yeah. who invited me to consider it from a different perspective, right? Belong first, believe, mm -hmm. and then behave, right? And I think that all of those three things have always been true and always important, but the Holy Spirit has an emphasis in different moments, in different seasons, in different mm -hmm. generations, in different countries. And I really do get the sense that right now in particular, and in our country, with all this division and polarity and all this craziness, there is this emphasis of drawing people to belong mm -hmm. as a starting point, as opposed to drawing people in, you know, calling people out, right? Like yeah. what you said, or starting from the standpoint of here's the 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 way that we practice or the doctrine or whatever it may be, let's start with that. It's more of like, hey, what's your name? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, can we chat? Like tell me about your life, yeah. what's good, what's what bad. What are you interested in? What yeah. are you interested in? And then of course, when people recognize that you're living the fullness of this integrated experience, it's attractive, right? Mm -hmm. And people want to draw closer to that and then learn more about like, what makes you tick? What's behind all this? What's mm -hmm. behind this belonging, welcoming attitude? And I think that's really important. And I think we kind of um, misapply that in some cases. You know, there's people who might say, hey, we gotta meet people where they are. And they kind of, their bias is on that. Mm -hmm. To those people, I would say, yeah, but we don't leave people where they are. Yeah. And then there's other people who say, let's show them the way. And their bias is on, let's show them the way. And I said, yeah, but we don't beat them over the head because they're not there yet, mm -hmm. right? So as Catholics, we're called to bring this whole thing together. Bring all of that, yeah. Right, meet people where they are, show them the way. And then the new thing, or not new, but just the emphasis from the Holy Spirit is walk with them on the journey. Mm. So I'm meeting you where you are. Here's where we should be going. Let me, let, let's, let's go together. I, right? I, that's yeah. kind of the thing. And I, I think that's like a, like a, a balm to, I think, like what, what the pandemic like unleashed, right? Like I think mm -hmm. we had, we had the, the pandemic of, you know, COVID, yes, but also of loneliness of how oh, many yeah. people suffered um, with loneliness and how many people continue to suffer with loneliness. I mean, if you look at mass shootings, if you look at all these issues that we have, that's the core of what the issue was. Absolutely. And so accompaniment, like you're saying, to walk with them, we're addressing that issue. Like, like how, like, what can we change with that? Just to sort of illustrate that point, um, my wife and I uh, work with homeless families mm -hmm. and have for 20 years. Uh, in fact, right now we're thinking about uh, developing a master plan community for mm -hmm. homeless ha uh, families in Los Angeles. It's a big dream that we have. I was, you know, talking with my wife with a person who is a benefactor, right, of these kind of things. And obviously I won't name who it is, but this person was talking about how they, they've they been interacting with a homeless person for seven years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this person brings them food and, you know, deals with some of their material needs and they always meet them in the same spot. They're always on this street corner and blah, blah, blah. 
And we, we heard this story, and at one point at the end of it, it was very lovely, and of course, all good, right? Mm-hmm. My wife turns to this person and says, you've been seeing this person for seven years, this homeless guy, what's his name? And that's what was heard, right? Mm-hmm. And that's not to castigate somebody, because what they did was good and noble and holy to try to take care of somebody. But it's the invitation Mm -hmm. to get at the root of what is really happening, right? Because that loneliness of being on the street is deeply, you know, satisfied when somebody sees you, Mm -hmm. recognizes you, asks you your name, is you're not invisible to them anymore. Mm -hmm. That sandwiches are good. They're goods. Don't anybody get the wrong idea. But there's something fuller, deeper, more noble, right? Mm -hmm. That's, That's what I'm talking about. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank <laughs> you.